guys it is your favorite work buddy <laughs> i'm just kidding hi you guys it's shamira i am back to do another day in the life of a medical coder video because it has been so long since i've done one um right now i'm just sitting here working and i'm going through my work queue where all my um charges come in that I have to code so right now I'm looking at let me see what is this no this looks like a prenatal visit uh, that the patient came in for uh, if this is your first time watching one of my videos I'm an OBGYN encoder so a lot of the stuff you will hear will be um, obstetrics and gynecology related so Looks like they did an NST, which is a non-stress test on the baby um, to make sure everything was all right. And it looks like there was um, fetal tachycardia. So that is going to be a diagnosis for 0368330 because she is in her third trimester. Let me fix all these other diagnosis codes that they have on here. And let me see how many weeks is the patient, 34 weeks. I'm gonna look at the payer. And for this prenatal visit, the provider is billing an e &M, and that is correct. But I'm gonna add modifier 25 because we're billing a minor procedure on the same day, which is the NST. So modifier 25 will go on the ENM. And now I just need to check the documentation for the NST to make sure they have everything before I can go ahead and bill it out. And it looks like it says here in the comments that a BPP was done. So now I'm going to check to see if they billed for that biophysical profile, because if they did, I would not bill the 59025. Um, we would bill the 78618. That code is for a biophysical profile with an NST. So if you bill for, um, let's say the NST, which is 59025, and then 76819, yep, it looks like they did bill it. I see it here. Um, that is unbundling because there is a, one code that bundles both of those together. So now I have to go get their 76819. That was billed on the same day. And I'm going to correct it to 76818. And then for my charge, um, I'm gonna change it to a no charge code because I can't bill the 59025 now that we're billing the 76818 but I will keep modifier 25 on that e &M because um, 76818 or 76819 either way those are minor procedures so you do need to have modifier 25 with your e &M. so I'm just going to put a comment here that BPP with NST was performed in office And I'm gonna go ahead and send that out. And then um, this e &M charge, hang on, it's telling me, oh, I forgot to link the weeks of gestation for this one. Okay, so now it should be good. And I can go ahead and send this out. So next up, I have an endometrial biopsy. Um, we have a diagnosis for postmenopausal bleeding. That is the N95-0, and that is the reason um, the patient came in was to have the biopsy. So we're not going to bill an E&M unless it was something completely separate that would be billable. Um, usually, if the patient comes in for a procedure, you don't bill an E&M um, because there is a... Um, technically, they say there is like a E&M in the uh, procedure that you would be billing so you wouldn't bill extra uh, let's see here so postmenopausal bleeding 
and I'm looking at the documentation. Now I gotta check pathology. Okay, I did not get a diagnosis from pathology, so we're gonna go and bill with the 58100 for the endometrial biopsy, and this one is good to go. All right, my next one is another prenatal visit. This is the patient's first um, preg exam visit. So my office, they will do um, their prenatal teachings and they'll do the preg exam on the same day. Some offices, they do them on separate days. My office, they get everything done on in one day. So I'm just gonna change these diagnosis codes around and then I'm going to check for her LMP because I need to create an attachment for that. So she's going to be due February 6th of 2025 and her last period was April 30th. So this one is good to go. What do we have next? Let me see here. I have two more office procedures and then we're going to get into deliveries, which is, you know, one of the, I don't know. I would say one of the better things to code, but it, it depends. It depends. <laughs> I like looking at vaginal deliveries um, because they're just like straight to the point. Sometimes C-sections, they can get a little wonky depending on what's going on. I've never had one though where they had to do a hysterectomy. I've seen it. Like one of my coworkers had one where they had to do a hysterectomy during the um, cesarean delivery, but I haven't had one yet. Um, but let me look at this office note. So this patient came in because she has a lesion on her vulva and they're going to do a biopsy. So again, we're not going to bill an e and um, we're just going to be billing the biopsy only. She had and keys punch use with forceps and surgical scissors to excise. Let's see, what did pathology come back with? Okay, so they say it's the condyloma acuminatum, something like that. Let me see. Condyloma. Okay, so that's A sixty three zero. Now for this, um biopsy and was it just one sample that was sent yeah so they only did one sample i don't know maybe there was a total of four and they only biopsied one i think that's the five six four oh, no that's an ind so let me pull up select coder because i don't have my book on my desk um i'm just going to search for my code here for vulva biopsy and biopsy on the vulva that's 56605 okay so i have 56605 and my diagnosis is a 63.0 so this one looks good I forgot this provider did message me and asked me to make sure she billed for a annual well visit and a procedure so I'm gonna have to go back into my messages to make sure I um, have that patient in my work queue so let me see where is my messages here 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 Okay, so she wanted to build 99385, so I'll go ahead and add that for her. And I'll put her provider in basket bill for 99385 and IUD removal. 
I'm just going to put that comment in there for when I get to it because I do not review the office E&Ms. I only review office procedures. The providers are responsible for all their E&M levels, like ultrasounds. I don't um, code for those either. So they're responsible for that stuff. Procedures that I do in the office are usually IUDs, or I should just say contraceptives, and um, like biopsies, excisions. Uh, what else do I do in the office? Uh, NSTs. I'll correct um, the biophysical profiles, even though I don't actually code them. So I don't look for the, di um, the documentation for the BPPs. I just correct their code if we build an NST on the same day to avoid unbundling or the charges won't go out. Um, what else do I review in the office? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Just like excisions. Oh, and I also do your, I review the urodynamics, which is like bladder Olympics is what they call it, where the patient may be having um, problems with um, bladder leakage and they want to see, I guess, like the, the functions of your bladder and how it it holds the bladder when you um, get an urge to go. It's just like a whole bladder Olympic procedure. <laughs> I review those. What else in the office? I can't really think of anything. Oh, colposcopies I review. Um, I already said biopsies, excisions, contraceptives. But yeah, that's pretty much it for the office. Everything else that's done at the office, that's the provider's responsibility to choose their correct code. Let's move along. All right, so I think I have one more office procedure and then we are gonna get into some deliveries. So I have a colposcopy and they did a biopsy on the vulva. So let's see. We are not billing an e and &M. I don't know why we have all these modifier 51s. <laughs> um, all right, let's look at the biopsy of the vulva first. What is our diagnosis code? It's a vulvar lesion. So that's gonna be this N9089 for that one. And let's see the documentation. All right, they did a punch biopsy to obtain the sample. Okay, so that's gonna be the 56605. Now I have to look at the colposcopy documentation. Our diagnosis for that is going to be um, the high uh, cervical high risk for HPV, which is R87810. And then they also have the ASCUS with positive high risk HPV cervical. So the ASCUS stands for atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance on cytologic smear of the cervix. So that is R87610. So those are my two diagnosis codes for the colposcopy. All right, so now I'm looking at the documentation for the colposcopy. All right here, specimen placed in the vagina with excellent visualization of the cervix achieved under colposcopic examination cervix swab times two with acetate acid solution no i say acetate i meant acidic hmm. all right so colposcopy with cervical biopsy and ecc they did the ecc with an ecc brush and they did the cervical um, biopsy with a punch and they put both of those samples in a container to be sent for pathology so i have to check pathology it looks like I have a better diagnosis for the vulva biopsy. It came back as low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, and it says VIN 1. So I'm not going to be using the N9089 for the 56605 anymore. For the cervix biopsy, I do not have a code. It looks like I'm going to keep the same um, diagnosis codes, the R87 codes, for that. But for VIN 1, let me look in my book here. 
whenever you see like Vin, Vein, um, Sin, like those acronyms, I always jump to neoplasia in my alphabetic index. And then you will see all of those abbreviations. So neoplasia, and you guys probably can't see because where the camera is, but I may take my um, camera off later and then do a quick snapshot of it so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But um, you'll see ain, sin, you'll see pin, vein, vin. So for this one, it's going to be VIN because it is the vulva. Grade one is N90.0. So I'm going to change this N9089 to N90.0 and it'll come up mild vulva um, dysplasia. So those are my diagnosis and CPT codes and this one is done. Okay. All this talking, I hope my coffee doesn't get cold. It's still a little warm, but I might have to go warm it up in the microwave. All right, so before we get into these deliveries, I'm going to go ahead and warm up my coffee because sometimes these take, um, I don't wanna say they take a lot of time, it's just a lot that goes into it because um, I have to include my coworkers' charges in with mine because we do the entire uh, delivery stay, whether it's our providers or not. So before, um, we would just submit whatever our providers did. And um, to give you look as an example, she has um, midwives and providers of other offices, but we are technically the same medical group. So like the same um, hospital organ organization our providers go to, uh, they have the same tax ID. So even though if my provider does the delivery, her providers may have admitted the patient or they may have discharged her. And before, because we wouldn't bill for those, the admission and the discharge, um, we would only be billing for the delivery since the patient comes came in to deliver. Um, before we would just, you know, submit our no charges that our providers did and then keep it moving. But now they want us to, whoever did the delivery, they will do the entire stay. That way you get the full picture rather than um, just getting like the delivery or just getting the admission and then you don't know what happened later on. So right now we are doing the entire delivery stay. So that's another reason why I wait um, to do deliveries because I don't have to have all her stuff in my work queue when I'm looking at office procedures, my outpatient hospital surgeries. I don't want all her stuff in my work queue when I'm doing that. So I wait until I have my inpatient charges because I change my filter on my work queue to show me everything that's in the work queue. And then I, I will um, go by patient's name. So that way I see everything. Right now, when I only have my stuff, I filter by the service date. So that way I'm working the oldest date of service. But when I do deliveries, I filter by the patient name and I have everything in my work queue. So I hope that makes sense. But let me go and um, warm up this coffee and then we will get into deliveries. Okay, so the coffee is nice and hot. All right, so let's get ready to start filtering. Um, what I like to do is I will take a snippet or a screenshot of all my charges before I add everything into my work queue. Right now it is on a filter setting. Um, so once I'm done taking the screenshot, I'm going to click a show all button and that'll show me everything that is in this work queue. So right now I have my snippet and these are all my patients here. Um, that I have deliveries for, even though you guys can't see it because, you know, HIPAA. Um, but now I'm going to filter it. So that way all my patients are now in alphabetical order. 
And then the second filter is on date of service. So I can filter three ways in my work queue. Um, now I'm gonna click show all, and I'm gonna go back to my little snippet here, and I'm gonna work on the first patient, which her last name is Okay, you guys, unfortunately, my camera cut out because it was out of storage. And I hate when that happens because I probably spent 25 minutes talking to you guys and now I have to do it all over again. So that delivery is already done. I, I finished the C-section. I ended up going with 59510 um, because I was able to bill for her um antepartum period which is the prenatal period the delivery and the postpartum period because of the pair um that we were billing to they allow us to bill what we call global where you include all three parts of the pregnancy and um bill one code so now i'm going to bill another delivery let me check here i will cross off this patient and I will move on to my next one. Maybe this one will be an easy vaginal delivery, but I kid you not, I spent over 20 minutes talking about that patient, and um, this one's another C-section, so um, I'm not even sure what all I told you guys I had to do because I got up to warm up my coffee, came back, and it literally recorded one minute, so I don't even know how much you guys got, but let me um go through this one this is going to be kind of similar to that one because it is another c-section so um let me see here what i do first and i don't know if i said this already but i'm just gonna have to repeat myself because i don't know what was caught and i'm not about to go watch it to know what i said so i'm just gonna do everything over as new so when i get a delivery i am going to look at all the notes so that way I can see how many um, no charges I need to put in. So that way um, on my inpatient note report that I have to run, which that report, it's basically just capturing any notes by my providers that they signed and there's no charge, whether it's a charge with a fee or no charge attached to it. They want to try and make sure we are capturing everything that the provider is doing whenever they're signing a note. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make sure I have all my charges that I need to have for every note in my work queue. So that way, once I'm ready to review every single note, I can just go ahead and um, knock all the note charges out and then do the delivery last. So looking at the H&P note, that's gonna be the very first note um, the provider will do because it's usually the admission note. And I need to enter a charge for that one because this provider did not drop a charge. I need to, um, uh, no, this one is good. What is this? Uh, this one is good. Uh, this one is good. That one's good. That one's good. Why are all these patients, like, not being discharged? So, I'm going to skip this one because this patient is still in the hospital. So maybe there's some complications. So we're gonna move on to another patient. Let's see. Okay, so this one's an easy one. This is a vaginal delivery. Um, and now I have to do the same thing. I'm gonna start with the first note and it looks like I have to enter a charge for this one. Um, let's see. Or do I not? Why well, can't, okay, there, is that it or no? Okay, here it is. Okay, so that's good. That one is good. That provider did drop a charge, but she should have dropped more charges than that, but it's okay, I'll just add them on. And this one is good. And then our discharge summary, who did that? Is that provider, okay. So, this provider did the discharge and i like to look at my um, discharge summary first just to give me an idea on how the hospital the entire hospital state went so i know if i need to look out for anything 
um, like any complications or anything. So I'm just going to look at this discharge summary and it was everything was uncomplicated. So I'm going to go with Z39.2 for my diagnosis code for the discharge summary. And then they also have another progress note for the same day. And it does say depression. So 0.99345 for mental disorders complicating the puerperium and depression. So I'm just going to use the S53.0 for postpartum depression. And I think that is it. These are no charge codes again because we will be billing um, global. So I just put a comment that these would be included in the delivery. Now my next one is gonna be another no charge. Same thing for postpartum depression. And then let's see, what do we have next? All right, looks like we have two more um, charges to review before the delivery. So let me. Put those in and let's look at this HMP note. So this would be the first note the um, provider did for the admission. And the patient's water broke before she came in. And it looks like, let's see how long before she delivered. Okay, so she delivered um, within 24 hours of her water breaking. So I'm gonna go with the 042 point zero two for my primary diagnosis code and depression is also mentioned here in the HMP note so I'm going to use 099344 and um, the depression code which is 04 no which is F32.9 um, let's see here That looks good. And I have one more note by this provider. That looks good as well. All right, now we have our last provider that um, is also going to do the delivery. So I'm just going to pull up this note before she delivered because they did go in and see her. I'm going to keep the same diagnosis codes. I can get rid of the depression one because they don't mention it on this note. Um, but it looks like this was the last time they went in to see the patient before she delivered. So let me check one more. Nope, that's good. And okay. Here we are at our delivery note. I'm gonna go down to check the midwife's documentation because um, she was working with a resident, but I cannot use the resident's documentation because um, our CNMs are not teaching physicians, so I can only use the midwife's documentation. Um, let's see. There was a tight nuchal cord, so I have to use 0691XX0, and that code reads labor and delivery complicated by cord around the neck with compression. And is there anything else? No. So I have my 
weeks of gestation and um, let's see. and my outcome of delivery. So those are there. Now what I have to do is check her coverage to make sure she had the same coverage throughout the entire pregnancy. And um, make sure we can bill global. So. I just have to make sure that they submitted the 0502F throughout the entire pregnancy and the 0501F for the initial preg exam with a provider. If that is the case, I can go ahead and bill global, which is the 59400 code. Okay, I don't see a 0501F, so let me see when her preg exam was. Okay, there it is. Yep, they build everything correctly. So we are going to build 59400. And um, that is it for this delivery. See, these ones are so much easier. That last C-section, man, it was just like so much. Even though it was a regular C-section, like there was no, no complications. It was just so much going on prior to her being... Um, sent to do the c-section because they tried multiple attempts to get her to um induce you know and have the labor start but for some reason she just it it, it wasn't happening so they elected to do a c-section or made the decision to do a c-section and um my primary diagnosis code for that one was the 062.1 which was for the failed induction. And um, then her uh, postpartum period, that was fine. Um, I think she was getting ready to be discharged uh, today. So um, that was like another patient where it was like, where is the discharge summary? And it was because she's technically still admitted. And the one that I talked about before I did this one was kind of the same thing. They had did a C-section and the patient was still admitted. So I really don't like doing um, or billing for the deliveries when the patient is still admitted because there may be some complications and we may have to start billing for um, E&Ms after the delivery. So I just like to wait until the patient's out of the hospital so that way I can get everything. I see the entire picture and I'm able to bill everything out at once. So yeah. So this one, I'm just gonna put a comment that I reviewed the vaginal delivery and I'm gonna go ahead and send that out. Um, I'm trying to think, cause I did have a question where somebody had asked me um, how you would bill if the coverage changes, like how would you bill the antepartum or the prenatal visits? Well, you would just have to count um, how many visits the patient had with each of those payers. So in your CPT book, uh, where's mine? All the way over there. Okay. And mine's is the 2023 one because my um, employers, they made us pick one book. So I went with the, um, what is it? It's like the OBGYN coding companion book. Uh, that's the one I picked. But if you are having to bill out the antepartum period in your CPT book in the vaginal delivery antepartum and postpartum care section, which is right over here, it tells you the number of visits you can bill. But you also want to pay attention to the payer and their policy for deliveries because like if you're billing medicaid most of them they want you to just bill e&ms for the prenatal 
um, visits. But if you're billing like a commercial payer and they allow you to bill global, you just go by what these visits here say. So if the patient had four to six visits with one payer and it's commercial, you're billing the 59425. If each payer, let's say, had seven visits or more, then you're billing the 59426 to each of those payers. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> so you just bill based on how many visits the patient had um, with each of the coverages and you go by that. It does say for one to three antepartum visits, which are your prenatal visits, you're gonna bill E&M codes right here in parentheses up top. So if they didn't have four, then you're billing E&Ms for each one, which is going to be your office visits. So the 99212, 99213, 99214. I have never billed a 99215 for a prenatal visits because those are usually pretty quick and nothing severe is happening, but that is the E&M codes that you would bill. Now, remember, you want to follow the payer policy um, and bill that way. So, for example, if you are billing commercial and they have four visits, what I would do is I would count the 0501F, which is the preg exam, the very first one, and let's say they had three more visits, which would have been the 0502F, and those are the routine prenatal visits where they come back. So those are the four charges that I would see in the patient's account. And if the coverage changed after that fourth one, I'm billing 59425. I'm not going back and changing the category two codes because those are tracking codes and those will have the dates of services that the patient um, was seen in the office. And then the same goes for the other half of the coverage. So it will pick back up with 0502F. You do not bill 0501F mid-pregnancy because she's not getting another preg exam. Her coverage changed. These are still routine prenatal visits. So you are billing 0502F if the payer wants you to bill that way. And then you just count how many of those you had and then you bill based off of that. So that is how I bill antepartum um, periods. And I hope the person that asked is still, you know, around to get the answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did want to answer that. Um... But yeah, I think that's it. I have been talking for over an hour now and I'm ready to get back to my peace and quiet. <laughs> In the end of the video of the part that got deleted, I did say like, um, I normally am watching YouTube when I work and today and yesterday, the person that um, like is kind of like one of my favorite YouTubers, she didn't she didn't um post anything for the past two days and i was thinking like oh my gosh like i i wonder what's going on because i you know i miss seeing her videos and it's only been two days you guys versus me i've been going for probably over 20 days and i was thinking like oh my gosh what if i'm that person for one of my subscribers and i'm totally mia right now so i was like oh my gosh let me just turn on this freaking camera while my son is asleep well everybody is asleep and um give you guys some content so you guys can enjoy it this morning. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for, you know, continuing to support my channel, even though I'm not very consistent. I do want to get better at being consistent because it's really not that hard. It's turn on the camera, talk about what you're doing and people love it. So it's not, it's not really hard. Um, I do have some more content coming because I have been on my book tube Oh man, I've been loving booktube lately. Just watching people uh, do reading vlogs, talk about their books, give book recommendations. I bought almost 15 books in the past three weeks and I cannot wait to share with you guys. So again, thank you all for watching. I will see you in my next one. Bye guys.